some of the most experienced engineers at Google published an article titled Performance Hints. Within it is a well-known table of latency numbers, how long different operations take on modern systems. The exact numbers themselves don't matter. What matters are the orders of magnitude. I've seen this table many times before. I understood it intellectually, but I never really had a visceral feel for what each number meant in practice. In this video, I want to build that intuition. Let's talk about some real life examples. And these are only approximations, of course. First, a game engine. At 60 frames per second, each frame has less than 17 milliseconds. In that time, an entire universe is rendered. Animation, physics, AI, hundreds of thousands or even millions of operations. Here, the program is fighting for every microsecond. A cache miss can literally result in a dropped frame. The second example is a database. A database exists to fetch data, data that ultimately lives on disk. Now we're talking about latencies that range from microseconds all the way to tens of milliseconds. Here, the fight is against disk access. Performance is about having your data available in RAM or even better, already in CPU cache. A cache hit is cheap, a disk hit is painful. For the third example, imagine we have a web service that's calling a third-party API across the internet. At this point, CPU and memory barely matter. The time is almost entirely dominated by the network. Ingestion, routing, that's the bottleneck. Whether the data is in L1 cache or RAM barely matters compared to a 100 millisecond plus round trip. Let's get a sense of scale. Modern CPUs run at a few gigahertz per second. Gigahertz is a billion pulses or cycles per second. A modern CPU is capable of running multiple instructions per cycle. Now let's do a quick unit check. One second is a billion nanoseconds. It is also a million microseconds and a thousand milliseconds. So billion for nano, million for micro, and thousand for milli. Modern computing relies heavily on caching. The basic idea is as follows. Keep the things you're most likely to need as close as possible. It's like working with a book. If you have it on your desk, you can open it instantly. If you need to walk to the library every time, then even short lookup becomes expensive. L1 and L2 caches play that role for the CPU. They store frequently and recently access data right next to the core acting as a cache for main memory. That proximity to the core is what makes accessing them orders of magnitude faster than going directly to RAM. There are multiple levels of CPU cache, L1, L2, L3. The lower the number, the smaller the cache is, but the faster and the more expensive it is. So L1 is the fastest and the smallest, then L2 and finally L3. So we can see L3 is generally shared across all the cores of the CPU. Do we really need these different CPU caches? Can't we just rely on RAM? Let's take a look. If our CPU needs some data, and it certainly does, either variables or actual instructions to run, and that data is available in L1, it practically won't have to wait. The latency is approximately the same as the time needed to run an instruction. If the data is only available in L2, the CPU would have to wait a few nanoseconds. If it's only available in L3, that would be more than 10 nanoseconds, which is starting to add up. However, if the data needed by the CPU to run the program is not available in CPU cache, needs to be fetched from RAM, then the CPU would have to spend more than 50 or 70 nanoseconds waiting for the data to arrive. A CPU capable of running more than one instruction in less than a nanosecond would have to spend more than 50 nanoseconds waiting, which means that the wait time would dominate the total time. Let's pay attention to the size column. So for L1, it's rather small. It's only kilobytes. For L2, it's from a few hundred kilobytes up to a couple of megs. L3 can reach up to 64 megabytes. And finally, we enter gigabyte territory with RAM. So why does size matter? If your data fits in the L1 or L2 cache and it's there, you'd only need a few nanoseconds to get it. If you, however, encounter a cache miss, you'd incur a plus 50 nanosecond penalty to get it from RAM. Let's take a look at some code. In front of me, I have a function that will allow us to get a sense of the L1 and L2 cache access time. So we simply allocate an array 
and then we iterate over it and perform simple addition. We record the time before and after the loop and finally divide the difference by the number of iterations. Given that the array we're providing is small enough, I believe it's only 64 kilobytes, we should only remain in L1 territory. Second example accesses memory that should not fit in the CPU caches L1 or L2. But as we'll see, even though the data is not small enough to fit into the CPU cache, the compiler and the processor are smart enough to predict the access pattern. And since we are simply accessing it sequentially, it will retrieve the data proactively and we'd only pay the RAM penalty at the beginning and we end up accessing the rest of the data from the CPU cache. In the third example, we want to actually measure memory access time, so RAM latency, and prevent the system from being too smart with us and fetching data proactively into the cache. And to do that, we perform what's called pointer chasing. So we basically create, allocate N nodes and create a linked list whose order is random. So we shuffle permutations and follow that random order by creating one long cycle. By traversing the list and performing some basic operations, we are sure that it's not predictable. And even if the compiler or CPU tries to optimize, it will result in cache misses and we'll end up actually fetching the data from RAM. So looking at our results, the L1 cache access time is 1.4 which is not far from the advertised value on the table. The contiguous memory access is way lower than the 50 or 70 nanoseconds, because as I said, we are accessing contiguous memory and the compiler and CPU are smart enough to fetch the data proactively into L caches. And finally, with pointer chasing by forcing cache misses, we are incurring upwards of 100 nanoseconds to access RAM. If we tie this back to the game engine example in which performance is critical, this means that we need to keep the current working set small enough to fit in L1 and L2 and to avoid cache misses. Also, we need to avoid pointer chasing. So instead of having an, orient, an object oriented design in which you'd have a, a chain of pointers, it's best to use arrays that fit in L1 and L2. CPU cache and RAM are volatile. If we lose power, data is lost. If we want persistence, we need to use disks. So there are two big families of disks, SSD, solid state drives, and HDD, which are actual disks. SSDs are way faster than HDD, but as with other types of storage, they are more expensive. So the faster you are, the more expensive you end up being. If we come back to our table, we can see that reading four kilobytes from an SSD is requires 20,000 nanoseconds or 20 microseconds. For HDD, it goes to the milliseconds. So we're talking millions of nanoseconds up to tens of millions of nanoseconds. So a few milliseconds, basically. HDD is still used for cheap storage, especially in archival and things like that. But in most modern laptops, we use SSDs. And one thing to pay attention to is that even SSD, which is considered faster, is still hundreds of times slower than main memory. So if you have some data available in RAM, it is hundreds of times faster to access compared to SSD. In this function, we open a temporary file, write a 4K buffer to it, then we perform a thousand iterations. Uh, in each iteration, we read from the file, we perform addition, and that's it. We record the time before the loop and after it, then we divide the difference by the number of iterations. When I run this, I should get the time it takes to read 4K bytes on my laptop's SSD on average. Fortunately, I see a very low value, 459 nanoseconds, which is way lower than the expected 20,000 nanoseconds. Why is that? Because my file system and my OS is too smart. It's performing caching on my behalf. So the way to actually test the disk speed is by informing the file system that they do not want any caching for this file descriptor. 20,000 nanoseconds. That's pretty close to the value that was indicated. If we go back to the database example, we see that the main challenge is balancing 
the disk access with the memory access and ideally making use of CPU cache. So that's the main design challenge databases face. How can I have data that ultimately lives on disk be as close as possible to the CPU so the queries are fast? When it comes to networking, things get way slower. One interesting fact is that it takes light to travel through fiber optic cables around the Earth at least 200 milliseconds. And this is without accounting for equipment or network congestion. Although within the same data center, a round trip is only 50 microseconds or 50,000 nanoseconds. The moment we start traversing continents, we exceed the 100 milliseconds which is when compared to the 50 nanoseconds of memory or the sub nanosecond of L1 cache, it's millions or hundreds of millions of difference. So I have in front of me a list of DNS servers located in Australia. So it only takes 25 milliseconds to get a response from a close Google DNS server. When I try to query the server located in Melbourne, it takes 300 milliseconds so location matters a lot that's why having services within the same cloud region or far apart regions have a great impact on the latency and performance of your services anyway i hope this has been informative let me know what you think in the comments and if you enjoyed the video don't be shy with the like and subscribe buttons